While I've never really done one myself, not intentionally anyway, I'm fascinated by long-term creative projects. I find the whole idea of intentionally and purposefully immersing yourself in something you know is going to take years to realize both inspiring and a little terrifying. But I guess if you find the right project, the challenges, the obstacles, and the accidents, both happy and unhappy, make the journey of bringing whatever it is to life that much more rewarding. Mark Wilson is a photographer in the UK who has completed two such projects back to back. From 2010 to 2014, he produced a body of work called The Last Stand, which, in his words, quote, aims to reflect the histories and stories, military conflict, and the memories held in the landscape itself, end quote. In 2015, after releasing the body of work as a book, he began work on his next project, A Wounded Landscape, Bearing Witness to the Holocaust, which is based around 22 Holocaust survivor stories. The six-year project, culminating in a 750-page book, was made in 20 countries at more than 160 locations and is told through more than 350 photographs as well as transcripts of conversations, research, and sound. I am so grateful for the opportunity to talk about this powerful and important body of work. My name is Jeffrey Sidoris. I'm talking to Mark Wilson, and this is Process Driven. Please listen carefully. your mind at with with where this project is at after after working on it for what, um, six years now right yeah it's it's, it's good I, I think what's helped a lot is that the the bulk of the work the you know the kind of photography and the research that went along with it i completed about a year and a half ago um so for the last year and a half has been that's when we kind of started looking at the book and started designing the book and due to you know various reasons and obviously covid and stuff like that the, the book design is kind of and it, it's not that it's dragged out because it hasn't that way at all, but it, it's kind of gone quite, I guess you could, some people from the outside may think it's taken quite a long time, it's mm -hmm. gone quite slowly, but it's been really nice because it's it's allowed me to, and it's, it, I've never wanted to step back from this work, but it's allowed me at this point to take a bit of a pause and a bit of a breath so I can, when, when I'm kind of working with the designer in terms of the book, you know, it lets me to a point do that one thing that you need to as a visual artist is to try and put yourself in the shoes of the viewer right and because we've had this small kind of break between you know doing most of the photography etc stuff like that it's, it's allowed it's helped me in that process which is really good but then at the same time it's now fantastic that we're kind of and i still got two portrait well one portrait left to take sorry um but now we're really into the design of the book and we're running this kickstarter campaign which and so it means that the book could be published in you know, like three months or so it's it's incredibly it's really exciting because it suddenly feels like I'm falling back into the work again, which which I enjoy doing because I like to be um, I, I like to be completely immersed, you know, in my it's, you know my project or you know my subjects, etc. It's you know, it, it's what feels right for me as a, as a photographer to be immersed in that way. So whilst that pause was quite nice, it was quite good for my kind of sanity in some ways, and you know I was had a lot going on in my personal life at the time as well. Um, I missed it a lot because I missed the I miss the, the stories that I was telling, you know, um, and I there's a sense of urgency as well to get it out because it's obviously, you know, the people whose stories I'm telling are the ones who are still with us, are, you know, they're elderly. Um, and four of the people whose stories I'm telling have died since I've started making the project. So oh, wow. it's kind of, you know, you just you want to kind of um, I, I want to make it and I, I want it to be a whole, a, you know, a singular thing, which in this case is a book so that. You know, it's one so that lots of people can see it, but one of the main reasons is so that I can make these 22 trips and give these people or their families a copy, you know, their copy of the book and stuff like that. So that's it's really important to me. So it's now at that stage where um, I'm eager, you know, and I've used the word exciting and I've used just used the word eager. And, you know, so you can imagine every time I, I have this word about on the tip of my tongue, it feels like the wrong word because right, right. I shouldn't be eager. Am, am I respecting but, this project yeah, if I'm yeah, eager I, to I, talk I, about yeah, their pain? And I should yeah, be yeah. excited and stuff like that. But, you know, I, I know that I'm using these words because they're, they're positive words mm -hmm. in that way. And I know that I've made the work in a really respectful way. So it's OK. Um, but, yeah, so it, it's, it feels really good to be immersed in the work again. And, you know, and I've been having conversations, you know, with, with the story, with the people whose stories I'm telling and they're they're excited to see the book as well you know they they want to see it they and they don't want to just see their part of the book but they want to see the whole thing so it's 
it's it, it feels really good it feels like um it doesn't feel like an end point it doesn't feel like completion at all but it feels like i'm i'm getting to the point which is gonna mm -hmm. um ah, kind of put meat on the bones of the of the work that i'm doing mm -hmm. you know this is so it goes from me making work and having conversations and showing some images on my website to really having something that I can hand over to people and I can show to people and that then you know hopefully you know in terms of the book you know one two thousand other people can then have these stories in their hand as well in their hands as well and you know read the stories and look at the stories and kind of and then share them themselves with their friends and colleagues etc so it it kind of it pushes that sharing process on the same way that the people whose stories I'm telling have shared their lives with me I'm now sharing them with you know hopefully these other people as well so sure. it's it feels wonderful to be honest you know really really good talk to me about the selection process and and the approach process because this is such a i, I can't off the top of my head think of a more personal you know sort of story to tell a stranger than than these stories that that are are that you're presenting in this book so how when when you enter someone's life enter someone's home how do you present this project and and how do you sort of earn that trust to to tell that story to be responsible for telling their story yeah that's um it, it takes a long time i think to do it but then i think once you're in front of someone and you know i, I never kind of walked into someone's house cold as right. it was it was never anyone that i that i met and said can i come and meet you and stuff right like that. it was always you know there was there was emails and there was phone calls and there was connections and stuff like that um and would one person sort of suggest or lead you to another person was there a connection yeah, that way yeah. i mean obviously no i'll get onto that but completely so there was and the reason for that was really really important to me i never when i when i when i knew that i wanted to tell stories these these stories i never wanted to make a choice um i never wanted to choose one story or go looking for one particular story because it had a particular location involved in it, or it came from a particular country, or there was a particular element to the story, because I never wanted to to think myself that well, this story is more important than that one, so that's why I'll choose this story, not that choice, because that's you know I have no right to do that because everyone's life is as important as everyone else's. So I I kind of questioned myself really early on. I thought, well, how can I how how will I find these stories? And it it ended up being exactly as what you just said. The, you know, the, the first story I, I knew about is my own, because my own family story is one of the 22, mm -hmm. um, which is obviously the, the easiest in a way story to start with. Um, and the hardest, I would imagine. It, exactly. I was yeah. about to say easy is, is the right and completely wrong word. Yeah, at the same time, right. <laughs> you know, um, so it's the one I'd been avoiding all my life, um, but also had to, had to do. But but then the, the second story came out of that first story, and then the third story came from the second story, mm. and each each story led to another, or it led to a meeting, which led to a suggestion. So um, it ended up that all twenty two stories were, I I found them through other people. Wow. That way. Apart from one, one which I stumbled across on a a stone wall in a um, cemetery at a mass grave in a hill in Germany. Oh wow which then took three years to, to find that story in the end. Um, and then a few other stories which came to me from a bus journey in Israel, going from one location to another, telling two stories. Mm. and just talking to the girl who sat next to me and we kind of had a conversation about what I was doing. And I've, I've carried this little box of 10 to 7 by 5 inch prints around with me for the last sort of four or five years as well. So I showed her the prints I was making. And after, after we'd had this conversation, she's told me that she'd worked um, with this group that works with Holocaust survivors. And if she wanted, I could put her in, like she could put me in touch with her boss, as it were, who could then potentially put me in touch with people. Um, so she did that. And then, you know, so the first thing there is that the boss would then, he then, he said, yeah, let, let me talk to some people I know and we'll see if they want to talk to you. So it was always that. It was always if these people wanted to talk to me. So I knew that everyone I then met, um, they knew why I was there. Um, but then, it, you know, you get to that point where you have this maybe a phone call and people know you're going there, but then you walk through the door and it's something I've just been writing about. Um, so I've got like a, a, sort of a, um, a blog piece coming out next week, which someone else is doing. Um, and it was that thing that you'd kind of you'd walk in through a door and you'd meet this person who, you know, maybe I'd seen a picture of them before, but we'd and maybe we'd spoken you know, on the telephone or something. But normally I'd spoken maybe with their daughter or their son or something like that. And then you'd walk in and you'd have that first bit of contact which would be you know, like a shaking of a hand or just like the holding of a hand and then in, in within that split second because you can see someone's face and they can see your face and then they hear your voice and they see your smile um 
immediately there's that bond and that connection, I think. Um, but then there's still levels of not and mistrust isn't the right word at all, but there's still levels of for, from their point of view is, you know, what what, what are you going to tell? Um, you know, how can I trust you mm -hmm. in that way? Were, so, were they aware of your shared history in these experiences or your family's um, history? Uh, yeah, I would. I always try to let them know as much as possible. So yeah. the, you know, the first question they would always ask me, and I always like to let them, <laughs> them ask me a question first. Normally it was like, you know, after coffee and things was, um, you know, why, why are you making this work? And so what I did again is I always, like I said before, you know, I had that small box of prints. So I said, well, let me show you what I've been doing. Mm. So the first thing I would always do is show them the photographs I've been making, you know, the previous year or previous two or three or four years so that they could, they immediately would have a sense of the, the type of imagery I was making. So the kind of respectful and sensitive imagery I was making, that it wasn't, um, it wasn't of a particular genre or particular type and it wasn't pushing a particular agenda. Mm -hmm. um, and I would always tell them about my own family story and that, you know, my connection to the work and, and, you know, I, I'd explain to them the whole kind of, you know, the, the germ of, of the idea of the, of the work for me. And then it's kind of Genesis over the last maybe 20 years of why I've never made it before. And then why I suddenly felt as though I could make it. And sometimes I tell them a small story about the first location I went to in the South, in the kind of Southwest, Southeast, excuse me, in France, and stories there and so you know we'd have these conversations about not about me as a as an individual but about why i was making this work so we'd always always kind of share that so they would feel completely comfortable as to my reasons there is something about showing prints rather than you know an instagram site or a twitter site yeah. or even a, even a website there is something more not just physically tangible but but especially if you're talking to people uh, who are older, yeah. there is something about the tangible nature of a print that speaks, I think, to a deeper level than just showing them something on a screen. Is that your experience? Yeah. Totally and, and utterly. Um, and I think it, it's because, you know, you, you offer them something physical. You offer them this, in my case, this box with mm -hmm. a print on the front. Mm -hmm. And I would open it up and, you know, and take some photographs out. And then I think the, 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 the act of them holding the photograph in their hand, it, it was like a connection between them and my photography yeah so they could they could not just see right what i was doing and they, and they knew what it was like but you know they, they could feel it and, yeah you know they could they could so in a way they could feel the emotion that i was putting into the work and then this really wonderful thing that i, I didn't realize until about a year, year and a half ago is that you know i've still it's on my shelf i've still got this box of prints that has about 100 prints on it and the thing that I really love about that is that almost each and every single one of those prints has a fingerprint on it of everyone who's everyone whose story I'm telling in the book. And, you know, it's that's like one of those small unknown things right, that, will, right. that will never kind of go anywhere particularly. But it, it's a really beautiful thing for me to know that I have these people's fingerprints on these on these things. And, and so when I then show that box of prints to other people, for instance, it's. I, I tell them that now, and, and it's lovely because you really feel as though you're. So when you pick these prints up out of the box, you know that Rita or, you know, Eugene, for instance, have have held these prints in their hand as well, and these and those hands are the people whose stories I'm then sharing in the book. That That's way. really wonderful. Yeah, yeah, there there is an unseen sort of shared history with those prints as well. Yeah, yeah, wow. and it's, it's it's lovely though. And so, and then you know that the process was often what would happen is that the, these people, you know, um, they they would ask the first question they say well mark what do you want to know um and i always had this very clear in my mind that i, I never had a list of questions mm -hmm. i never i never wanted to interview people as such um i never wanted to ask them this question or that question or that question to get you know predefined answers about particular things and i told them that all i all i wanted was for them to share their stories with me and to share whatever story they felt comfortable telling me today you know yeah. in this moment whilst we're here yeah um, you're, you're just creating space in that exactly. sense yeah and, and yeah. sometimes they were still you know there was and some people would just start um and sometimes they were still the question well you know what where where do i start and then, so the only thing i would say was maybe you know, tell me tell me where you were born and and then from that point for the next you know sort of 40 minutes or the next sort of four or five hours or in some cases two days i would just let people speak and what i found is that when they kind of stop speaking it's because they wanted to have a pause so I, I wouldn't try and fill that space with a question but I'd, I'd let them you know take their pause and then they'd start again and you know the, the conversations went on for you know like I said hours at a time and 
I remember each and every single experience. I remember every cup of coffee and every piece of beautiful marble cake and every seat that I sat on. And I, I remember each conversation really clearly because it was a, you know, it's like from my point of view as an individual, they were, you know, 22 wonderful moments in my life because I was, I was let into these, you know, incredible, incredibly fascinating stories. Um, you know, these, and these very dark yet, and, but also kind of dark, well, dark stories told to me by really beautiful people. And they're beautiful people because, you know, they were happy to, to sit there and calmly tell me their stories and share, you know, their, their lives that are filled with unimaginable things for most of us. But, you know, they were happy to kind of sit there and take me in and share them with me. And they're, you know, amazing. And they're, they're, with, they're with me forever. You know, the, not just the words they told me, but the, the kind of the experiences of listening to them, you know, sat next to someone, you know, having, having my hand held. By someone as they tell me these things it's yeah stuff that will stay with me forever which is you know an incredible experience for me i think and so freedom meant very little to him uh, because he had nothing just himself and he was just a poor creature that weighed barely five stone uh, and barely alive I would imagine that hearing and experiencing these stories has given you, uh, if not a, a greater understanding, a greater appreciation of the stories of your own family. Yeah, it does. It's, it's funny. The um, my mum will probably listen to this. <laughs> so, Hi, mum. <laughs> yeah, it's um, she's amazing, obviously. Um, so the the fam the, the family story of my own family is about my great grandfather, so my mother's grandfather, who was born in Romania. Um, and we haven't actually sat down and had a long, long conversation about it. Really? Long, in, in senses that not as long as the other stories. And I think it's because with the other stories, you know, I've gone there and these people have known that this is that this is the day or the next day and, and they tell me everything. Whereas the story of my own family, we're, we're still kind of, I think it's still being pieced together in some ways and it's coming out and things like that. And I think, you know, it will, more of it will come out. But that, that's, a, that's a positive thing. And that's in a way, that's the experience that I want, that I would love if other people have that very similar experience. Mm -hmm. I've always, what I've always tried to do with my work is create work that triggers conversations. So, um, you know, to me, a successful piece of work and a successful photograph, let's say, is one where it stimulates thought and a conversation that potentially may not have happened otherwise. Right. And that conversation may be about the same subject matter, or it could be a, a conversation about a very different subject matter, but with similar, similar lines and threads running through it in that way. So I think that, which is that that's to me the kind of success my, my work will stand or fall on how many conversations this sparks and stimulates right. in that way. And is your mother kind of the keeper of your family history or are there other family members that, that, have different pieces of the story of your great grandfather. Yeah, very much that. And there's other family members that have other pieces. You say, and you know, my, so my mom's Swiss, um, so there's a lot of the kind of the Swiss side of the family that you know are, are researching this history, and some side of the family that work very closely with um, other Holocaust survivors, sort of bringing them into schools in France and Switzerland to talk to children. But then you know, my my family is no different to any to any other that that suffered. Um, these things or similar things, you know, that suffered trauma and tragedy. It's um, it's not things that you want to talk about every single day. Mm -hmm. Um, for, for, you know, for like the, the multitude of reasons. The main one being that you want to move forwards in that way, but not forget and not deny your kind of past as well. And then there's sometimes where you just can't, you know, you just can't talk about things. But it's been um, it's been a real experience, and it's really um, it's been a really important one for me because I don't feel as though um. I don't feel as though I could have treated and looked at the other stories in quite the same way without being one of the stories myself mm -hmm. in that way, because it, it gave me, um, and I never, I didn't kind of realize this at first when I was making the work, you know, but it, it's not that it gave me that sensitivity and stuff like that. Cause I would hope I would have that sensitivity anyway to other people's stories, but it gave me, it gave, I think what it gave me, it gave me an understanding of the unsaid things Sure. in these stories. Um, of not just the unsaid things within the conversation, but the, you know, the unspoken years and the unspoken generations of these kind of histories and pasts and things like that. And so I think that 
gave me um, a kind of extra layer potentially of kind of sensitivity to these other people who I then met. So I so I knew that it was never something that I could push mm-hmm. or or even ask in a way because I knew that and I felt this very strongly and this is why you know kind of going back to what I what I just said which is why I never particularly had questions is that I wanted these people just to share with me what they were comfortable with sharing. So I didn't I didn't want to treat what they told me as kind of pure testimony in a way and a lot of these people have you know have given pure testimony to various museums etc at other times maybe but it was very much about what they felt comfortable as an individual sharing with another you know with another individual mm-hmm. so that's what i could then share with another individual looking at my book in that way and i wonder whether maybe this was conscious or or maybe unconscious but on some level i would imagine that that having a shared history gave you permission in some way to tell the stories of others because you were also telling the story of your family i th- i think so it's it's a strange thing because you know you you often you look at cultural work and you kind of think well is only and a photographer or an artist from within that culture allowed to do work about that culture mm-hmm. you know about a group of people um and i i don't know about that i've never i've, I've always i always feel a bit uneasy about that the thought of that um of, of crossing those lines well, no no the thought of that you're not you're not allowed to cross i see those lines. i see i um, see but then you know but at the same time there's you know there there is that inbuilt innate greater understanding if you if you do have that shared history so perhaps it allows you not necessarily to know more but to understand things that you wouldn't understand otherwise and not for not for bad reasons or for negative reasons but it's just impossible to understand you know un- unless you've experienced it in some way and maybe that then allows you as a as a visual artist in this case to then create something that includes that level of understanding as well that just may not be possible from someone else mm-hmm. but if I, but i don't know because it's um I think the only way I would know that is if I tried, if I approached another piece of work that I had no shared history with, right? And then, I, then I'd be able to realise whether it's whether I wasn't able to do it to the same level because I don't have that shared history. But it's, I, I don't think it can be a negative thing. I think, I think it could potentially be because it could, it could cloud your visual judgment and it could cloud your editing process and your kind of, you know, your creative clarity and stuff like that. But I think the, and at least the way I've done it is I've, I've embraced all those things. And so I haven't tried to cut myself off from it. I haven't tried to hide myself from it, but I've, I've let everything kind of not wash over me, but wash into me mm-hmm. in that way and not be afraid of experiencing and listening and, and facing things so that I can then make the best work possible. Well, what I thought was the best work possible. Have you noticed maybe something that we wouldn't notice as a viewer, but have you noticed a, a change in understanding or, or in approach across the six years of this project that, that you see it differently now than you did when you first started, or has it been a, a fairly consistent experience throughout? Um, it, it changed vastly actually um, on the first day, <laughs> the first day of, of making photographs. And it then changed again about, you know, kind of a few months later when I when I started the work, it was after I'd just finished my previous body work, The Last Stand. And kind of going backwards and forwards in a bit, this this work about the Holocaust, I'd, I'd always wanted to make a piece of work about it um, for, you know, like 15, 20 years. Hmm. But I never felt I was good enough. Really? Um, Technically I, or? Um, in, in every possible way. I, really? I, I, I had ideas in my head, but I didn't know how to art- visually articulate them. I didn't know how to... Um, articulate them in in sense of visual language you know what what do I want to talk about um what's important to talk about and at the same time I didn't think I was good enough in the how to visually you know that even if I did know what to talk about I didn't I basically didn't think I could take photographs that were good enough for this particular subject matter interesting um and you know no one ever said that to me it was just a it was my own my own thing and I, I was fine with that and then when I finished the last stand you know I'd created this body of work that was visually very kind of you know quiet and gentle and sensitive and subtle but still about quite a strong strong subject matter Mm -hmm. Um, and so when I got to the end of that piece of work I thought you know what I'm ready to do this this piece of work about the holocaust because I think I've got this this quiet visual language that I've always been searching for and so when I started this new project my initial thought was that you know I was going to photograph it in the same way that I was going to stand on a hill somewhere or at a distance i was going to photograph an object or a place 
within the kind of landscape around it, you know, very much how I'd photograph the last stand. And so when I went down to my first location, which was in Rive Salt in the southeast of France, um, I was I was taking I took about three different cameras with me because I wanted to potentially shoot it on large format again or maybe medium format. And I had my uh, 35 mm digital camera with me as well. So I wanted to see which was the best way of making it work. And so my initial thought was I was going to drive there and I was going to find a hill, which I'd found on you know, Google Earth. Um, and I was going to stand on the hill and I was going to photograph this internment camp and show everything around it. And I remember I kind of walked to the top of the hill and I was setting my large format camera up and I put the hood over my head. And within a split second, it was like wrong, completely hmm. and utterly wrong. This and needs was, to be more intimate. Well, yeah, it was, yeah. It was wrong on a few levels. It was wrong because the, the, the choice of camera felt completely wrong to me because I felt like I was gazing and staring hmm. in a really objective way. Rather than what maybe being wrong. more immersed in it? Well, I didn't know what I had to do yet instead. Yeah, I knew what yeah. I couldn't do, if that makes sense. So, so that wasn't right. And then I also knew that I was, and then I took you know, the hood off my head, but I realized I was still just being objective. I was, and I knew why I was doing it, if I'm honest. You know, I was afraid to go closer. Um, I was standing from a distance because I didn't want to confront this stuff. Wow. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to step over the kind of the, the boundary level of this internment camp. Wow. So I, you I, were I, prepared I, to look from a distance, Yeah. but it had to be on those terms at that point. Yeah. And, yeah, you know, I, yeah. Knew, I knew what had happened at that place. Um, um, but yeah, you know, without really, and I hadn't gone there thinking I don't want to go close, but I, you know, my automatic thing was when I got out of my B and B in the morning or the, the first evening was not to go into the place, but to look at it from a distance. And I remember someone had asked me, you know, very, very close at the time as well. They'd asked me, um, and this was my mum's cousin who lives in Geneva and she, who does Claire, who does lots of work with Holocaust survivors. And she had asked me whether I want to meet some of the survivors who she works with. Um, and I said, no, not yet. I want to mm. wait a little while. But um, Why do you, you think know, that was? Honest, well, this is the thing. I was actually lying when I said that. Um, it's because I was afraid to. Wow. Because, and the reason I was afraid to is because I thought, well, you know, what, what can I say to, to this person? Right. Now, how can I stand there and say, I want to take photographs about the Holocaust? I want to make a piece of work because it's like, you know, who am I and, and what can I do? And so, and so I kind of, I, I pushed it away. So, but then when I, I then, you know, after not, not using the large format camera, I did some work with my medium format camera, but I also took some, um, some digital photographs from that hill. And then I went back to my B&B and I kind of looked at the photographs and I, I knew that it was completely wrong. I knew that, well, if I just carry on like this, I could, could create some images that were, from a purely visual point of view, quite beautiful, but it would be a complete and utter waste of time right. because I wouldn't be doing the work justice. It wouldn't be telling anything particular and they'd be far too objective and it was unnecessary what the work I would make would be unnecessary. That that um, seemed to work for the last stand though, but it, it yeah, obviously yeah, wouldn't work for this. Not for this. Yeah. So, you know, I was I was sad to be honest because this was I I finally felt I was ready to do this work and then I realised that I I wasn't. Um, and then I woke up the next morning and I kind of realised that well this is you know it's it's very obvious what I need to do. I need to step over this boundary and into this place. And then that's when it all completely changed for me. Um, that I'd kind of walked into this place and this was an old internment camp in the south of France, south east France, sorry. Um, and I'd been told about this particular barrack, which was barrack number K-12, and it's a barrack where children were kept. Um, and they were helped by Swiss Red Cross workers, veterans were there. Um, and I kind of wandered around this site for about a couple of hours. And it wasn't because I was afraid to find this this particular barrack, but it was, I was just looking for it because there was it was a huge site. Um, and I remember it so clearly now. And haven't, I used to speak about this quite a lot early on in the work, but I remember kind of going there and it was I found this barrack and it was... Um, it was only like a three-sided building now because one of the sides had fallen down and the, the roof had completely caved in. And it was um, it was maybe like 20 metres long and about mm -hmm. six metres wide or so like that, and you know, sort of a, a single storey high. And you, you couldn't see the roof because the, the roof was all tiles and I guess wooden supports and all the tiles had fallen in. And what I noticed is that whilst the tiles were all on the floor, there, there was this kind of snaking path that had been made through the tiles, which went towards some walls. And one of the things I've been told about this particular barrack is that the Swiss Red Cross worker had gone there with paints for the children who were staying there because the children were separated from their families. Um, and then painted these scenes on the wall of like mountains and streams and trains going oh, through wow. and beautiful things wow. and that you can still see them. And these these kind of empty snaking paths on the, on the stone floor through the tiles took you to those walls. Oh, and it was wow. incredible. So there I was you know, standing in front of these paintings that I knew had been made in like 1942, 1943 by these young children. 
and it it was it was beautiful really, you know a very beautiful experience in that way and then i i turned around and my boot that i was wearing um hit or you know landed on one of the tiles that was on the floor the ceiling um, tile yeah yeah and it made this kind of this it's a sound that i can't describe but it's like a crack but so there i am in this kind of three-sided building with no roof in a big wide open plain and it was a bit like the whispering gallery at st paul's in london that it was the loudest noise I'd ever heard in my life. Mm. Um, and, you know, kind of symbolism being what it was and how I was feeling and all these emotions that it was like, you know, the children kind of screaming and stuff like that. So I kind of walked, ran along this path back out. And then I remember as I was walking away from this barrack, I kind of noticed these small flowers on the ground and I walked past them. And then this, this really strange thing happened to me that I stopped after about 10 yards. And I thought those, the little flowers, for whatever reason you know symbolism again they were like the children at this barrack mm. and then i carried on walking away and then i thought oh, i should, I, should I, what, I, I should go back i should photograph these children and i remember actually saying that's worse to myself i need to photograph these children which was you know to photograph this flower so i went back and i took a photograph of one of the flower and then i stopped again and i realized that i couldn't just photograph one single flower but i had to photograph every single one because that act of making that photograph to me was like photographing these children right right and so the act of photographing a flower and therefore the child to me was like the act of me preserving their memory wow. you know, on, on film, et cetera, or digital in that way. So I kind of rapidly, without a tripod, photographed every single little flower that's on the ground. And then it was, and so that my whole kind of aspect, so what I realized at that point is that I needed to do much more with the work and I couldn't stand away from a distance. And then I started having conversations with people and it soon kind of became really apparent that what I needed to do was I needed to, tell stories in some way mm -hmm. so instead of you know just photographing location after location after location and making this kind of mass and showing the mass sprawling web um i had to do that but do it through stories to show the the, the very personal nature of the holocaust um which whilst you know we, we kind of talk about numbers and genocide you know whether it's like thousands you know, like, or ten or thousands or ten thousand or six million etc um every single one of those numbers is broken down to an individual and a number of individuals and so what was really apparent to me is that i needed to tell stories of individuals and that each individual would then reflect or be reflective of another thousand or ten thousand or hundred thousand or million of other individuals with very very similar stories and so that's when the the real and it's not an idea you know it's when the realization that i needed to tell stories kind of came from that point so the project kind of changed and my whole method working method as a photographer completely changed in that moment as well which was which is a real kind of revelation to me and it it i kind of realized that i had to become much more subjective with my work and really immerse myself in the work and i couldn't stand back and record things in a potentially beautiful but potentially quite offset distance and cold excuse me objective way as well so that's where that idea kind of sprung from so the it that's where the the first story then came about, you know, from my own family story, and it kind of moved on through there. It's that was a that was a long answer. But no, like, it's it wasn't yeah, a long answer at all. It was lovely. Yeah. It, it sounds like the the experience with the flowers, and and maybe it was there before, but it sounds like that may have given rise to to using audio in the way that you have. Is that is that tied together somehow, or was audio part of this from the beginning? Um, well, audio was I before I did my first story such. I was I'd started recording certain sounds at some of these initial locations mm -hmm. I was going to a field and, recording type sounds. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I didn't know what I was going to use them for, but it just felt like the right thing to do. And I think it was because I was at these the first few locations and I was there by myself. Mm. But I knew that I wasn't really there by myself, um, you know, because of the the people that had gone before me. Sure. And I also knew that I wanted to show people what I was what I was experiencing as I was making the work and not because um, I felt that the journey itself is interesting, but more that the experience, not the experience of making the work, but the, what I was as an individual experiencing in this location, mm -hmm. I realized that that's what I had to get across, you know, through photographs and text and sounds. Sure, like sure. I've, I've got a whole series of sounds that I've made at various locations, but obviously, obviously they're not in the book, but it was, but then it was, um, you know, sound was obviously integral to the conversations I had. You know, so I could record. Will there be yeah. uh, kind of an audio book or or a, a mixed media well, type of a yeah. presentation? What I wanted, I've always had the idea of doing, you know, kind of three three sort of aspects to this visual aspects of this work. That the book has always been the first idea. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then exhibitions as well. And I did have some exhibitions planned, but because of the, the COVID crisis, they've been cancelled. Um, right. Yeah, the world had to go and fall apart again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but, you know, and the exhibitions were that kind of extra layer because you could have prints on the wall, but you could also have, um, you know, projections on the wall and mm -hmm. you could also have sound. You could potentially have a moving image, which, yeah, I sure. have, you know, so you could have that nice combination and text as well. And then I've also always liked the idea of making a, an online archive of the work that I've created mm -hmm. so that a, a, an even wider audience can experience it and hopefully kind of learn from it in that way. And, and that's something that can involve, you know, any of the sounds that I've taken in that way, but obviously it's the, the sounds of, of the people's voices who I've recorded are much more, um, <clears throat> much more expressive than the sound of a stream or the sound of a train or the sound of a car or the sound of the wind sure. through the trees and stuff like that. Whilst those sounds are beautiful, um, that, they're they're not kind of truthful in a way like like a word is in that way you know not they, with this body of work yeah. i don't think i mean i i think you could do that with images from the last stand sort of the the field recording yeah. of making your way to those various locations that could be interesting but it it feels like a, a different balancing act from from something more personal yeah it's it's, it's almost an unnecessary added element to the images because the images are very quiet but then, then at the same time in the in the video that we made for the kickstarter campaign for this um there's some underlying sound mm -hmm. of some of the images which is like bird song from right, some right. of the locations i visited and that works really well there but i think it works well there because it's it's a short film made up of stills mm -hmm. so because you don't have that moving element to it i think it adds that extra layer that you need to allow you to kind of visually linger on a still whilst hearing some text and having this little bit of sound that goes in and out kind of behind it. Right. That way. But yeah, so those, those other elements of, you know, the kind of the exhibitions, the archive, that's, that's, I, I hope to come, you know, at a later date at some point. Right. Can we go back to the last stand for a little bit? Yeah, of course. Yeah. When I look at that body of work against what I've seen from, uh, from this body of work, I see them as related. I see them as, uh, not just in subject matter, but tonally and and just in feel. Is that intentional? Is do you see them as sort of uh, different acts of a larger body of work, or do you see them as as separate? It's um when I made the last stand, it was each image was so controlled mm -hmm. in the way that I knew you know before I went to these locations, I knew what I wanted the images to look like. I knew the lighting conditions, I knew the weather conditions, and, and I, I controlled them incredibly, not obviously, not literally, but I controlled it in the way that I chose when to make the photographs. Sure. So I, would, I, I wanted, I didn't want contrast, I didn't want harsh light, I didn't want shadows, I didn't want blue skies or sunshine, I wanted soft grey light. Um, I didn't, you know, I felt these, <clears throat> excuse me, these locations had enough kind of drama with them anyway, and I didn't need all those things, so I wanted to photograph them in the, the simplest, softest flattest light i could so that you just saw the object <clears throat> you know the, the concrete structure and then it would kind of almost melt into the landscape around it so i controlled it in the way that i i followed weather reports and i i only photographed very early on in the day when there was no people around and when the light was as flat as possible etc cetera, etc cetera. and so that's why the last hand was that kind of very you know i think like 76 out of the 80 images are just all gray skies mm -hmm. that way because really because like, of that, were yeah. there no surprises along the way? Because you you had yeah. made such efforts yeah. to control it. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it was easy. You know, I'd, I'd kind of went there and um, I get to a location the evening before, and I would do a recce using my phone, you know, and work out compositions and exactly where I wanted to stand, and then I just get up at silly o'clock the next morning and go <laughs> and you know with my tripod, and I knew exactly where my tripod was going to be, um, and then I'd wait for the light to be just perfect, wow. and then I take one shot. And then that was it. And then I'd pack up and I... You took only one shot. So it was almost well, clinical in that respect. Yeah, yeah. Very, you know, I, sometimes I did like... I mean, the, when you're doing, you know, with sheet film and you've got a, you know, a really big viewfinder, obviously. Um, right. You know, the light meter, to me, there was no reason to take a second, to, to waste a second piece of film on exactly the same shot. Mm -hmm. Because every time you do that, it's five pounds for the film and five pounds for, for processing. Right, stuff. right. Um, some locations I maybe did two or three different compositions. Um, but, you know, not that much. I think... For the whole book, The Last Stand, I used about 400 sheets of film hmm. over 400 years. 
four hundred. Excuse me, over four years. So <laughs> felt know, like four hundred years. Yeah, <laughs> it did, yeah. Um, so basically, I took four hundred pictures in four years, so, which is obviously a, a fairly small amount mm -hmm. of that. And you know, some of that was potentially from a financial point of view. Yeah, sure, sure. But it's all it's all I felt I needed to do, and it was completely precise and rigid and controlled. But that was kind of part of that work. And then when I when I started making Windy Landscape, I I before I even you know, went on that first location, I knew that I didn't want to work in the same way because it felt really trite to control the con the weather conditions and to only photograph these places when it was grey. Sure. Only photograph it just felt wrong. It felt like I was adding this extra layer that didn't need to be there. And it, it felt um it felt obscene almost for me to do that. Right. You know? Um but what I what I find is that, you know, but I still try and photograph early in the morning because if you're at a location, you may as well photograph when the light is as, as best you can and stuff. But I didn't kind of control the planet in that way. But what happens is that my my visual style is is just, you know, I think everyone has their own visual style. And I think it just comes across. And what surprised me is that, whereas the last now, for instance, it was all photographed on a single camera and camera format. A Moody Landscape has been photographed on three different formats. Um, with some film cameras and some digital cameras, but I've I still got that same look and feel to the images, you know, throughout the whole work, you know, even over a six year period. And so I, I think it's just because that's what I do, you know, that's the way I photograph. And I think that I think my the way I feel and the kind of sensitivity I have perhaps to the subject matter and what I'm trying to tell with the subject matter, you know, controls how I make a photograph. And I know that when I make a photograph, you know, I, I I don't rush and I still take as few photographs as possible. And, you know, when I'm looking through my viewfinder, whether it's kind of looking down with a 6.6 six camera or you're looking through a rangefinder viewfinder, I never take photographs quickly. I always consider, you know, kind of every aspect of the frame in that way. And I think it's quite, it's very slow photography, mm -hmm. but I think maybe that's, maybe that, maybe it's that that's the look that I kind of have throughout my work. Sure. It's, it's created not, you know, because I'm trying to control the light in this work as I did in the last one, but it's the kind of composition and the, the kind of the, the the kind of breath that I take before I press the shutter in that way. I think even though beyond the look, the subject matter they they are both on some level consequences of conflict. They are both yeah. the the evidence of atrocity. Yeah, and I think that's where I where I sort of made the connection between the two bodies of work is yeah. is. You know, and, and you, you talk about being very moved by, by landscape. I think I either read it in another conversation or it might even be in your bio that, that yeah. landscape and history and story is, is inexorably sort of linked to one another. Yeah, I do. I mean, I think all, all my work is about kind of the landscape memory and history. So the kind of me individual memories and histories, kind of mm -hmm, mass or individual mm -hmm. histories set within a landscape, because I think that's what visually interests me not necessarily from a photography point of view, but it's what visually interests me in the world in front of my eyes. And so that's what I take photographs of. So I think that's, you know, that's, that's a link between it. There wasn't like a, an historical link between right. the last land and the landscape, but it was kind of, it was a, a natural progression in a way, because, you know, the work I've just finished now is the work I've wanted to do first. But like, you know, as, as we discussed before, I haven't been able to yet. So it would it would always progress from something, and you know I'm I'm very lucky in the way that because these these bodies of work aren't uh, commissioned by by another body, you know, by a magazine or anything like that. It's I can choose what I want to make my work about. Sure. And I feel really lucky in that way. And you know that that's my point of interest. My point of interest is you know the fragments of memory and fragments of history you know, set within the world around us. You know, within the landscape. And the, the landscape can obviously. Not doesn't literally have to be you know the, the field or something like that it can be a you know housing estate for instance but it's it's the idea that those kind of layers of history and things and so I think you know that that's why my work kind of does that way and I think all my work will be uh, around around that kind of thing. I could I could see and I, and I was talking about this with my wife I could see this body of work at some place like the Holocaust Museum here in yeah. DC with with the audio accompaniment with the field recording accompaniment to to provide an in-person sort of immersive experience. Yeah, that, that, that's the kind of, that's what I would hope for in terms of an exhibition. It's, it's funny with exhibitions because they're always, you know, that I, I love going to exhibitions and I like my work being exhibited, but it, it's always seem, feels like quite a fleeting moment for the audience. You know, the audience will walk, basically walk past your work 
from left, generally from left to right. And sometimes they'll stop and look and then they'll walk to the next one at the next one. Um, I think that's why in some ways I prefer books because books allow the audience that chance to to really linger mm -hmm. with a piece of work mm -hmm. and to really engage with a piece of work on a very individual, personal level for as long as they want. And they can put it down and pick it up and put it down and pick it up. And I really like that yeah. about a book. Obviously, a book has certain constraints to it because it's very linear. You know, it goes from page one to page, in this case, 750. And you, you generally read it forwards and you can't really look at more than one or two pages at the same time. Whereas an exhibition is nice because you can stand and you can look around the whole gallery space. Um, well, and there's also the shared experience of it. A book is, yeah. is you know, by its nature, an individual experience and an exhibition or, or some sort of gallery show, you do get that that shared experience and, and whether it's just glancing at the person next to you and sort of nodding or making contact or yeah. having it evolve into a discussion, which has happened many times for me here in DC, it, there is this sort of collective experience of, of sitting with the work, which yeah, I find which really good. It's really positive. It's, you know, for instance, most of the, like a lot of the locations I've, you know, I've visited um, and photographed at, you know, a lot of them I found myself mm. there by myself. But a lot of other, some of the other locations, you're there and there's other people in there. And mostly those are the locations that are kind of you know, looked after places, museums as such, you know, sites in that way, as, as opposed to just a ravine by the side of the road or an old old building in Paris or something. Um, and the, the, the experience you have at a place like that is you do walk around and it's exactly as you said, you, you nod at other people that walk past you. You know, you, you don't often have a conversation because you don't need, there's nothing that can be said. Right or needs to be said in these places but you do have that shared experience which is which is a very positive thing i think and it, it makes you realize that you're not alone in these places which is good whereas most of the, a lot of the locations i went to where i was alone it was it was much worse for me personally because of that because i was so alone and you'd have all these thoughts and ideas and you know, images going around in your head especially because i knew things that had happened at these places to very you know to specific people right and when you have that shared experience of just walking past someone on a path and you, you nod and you potentially smile at them it, it's it's like you've just had a small conversation you've like you know you both know what's happened what's happened at this place and by sharing that that nod or that glance it helps quite a lot so i think in terms of a, a kind of exhibition museum that could work really well especially with you know audio visual and projection and sound and text and it it can become quite an immersive experience it's, i like the idea that it, it would have almost become a giant version of the book right inside a museum but you could walk around at any angle and you could talk with other people as you were looking at it so it would be that very different experience which you know which is nice i think the other thing is i've, I've you know given a, a, some talks about the work already and giving talks about it is, is fascinating because you can stand on a stage with your images behind you and you can go from one story to the next and to another and to another and one of the things about this work is that um Although it's about 22 individual story, all of these stories are connected with the other stories. Right. Um, you know, these people didn't know know each other at the time, um, but there's not a single story there that doesn't have some connection to one of the other stories. And some of them, you know, there's there's some locations which are connected by nine or ten of the stories. Um, and when you're talking about the work on a stage, it's easy because you can have different slides and images behind you, and you can bring sound into it. And the other really lovely thing is you can see the audience's reaction as well, and you can kind of meander and veer off and talk about things like that as well. And you can get some of that in the museum experience as well. I think as long as it's not just a, and you know, apologies to, to some you know, galleries, but as long as it's not just that dry print, 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 print experience, but it does have that other level right. of kind of, of you know a personality to it. So it has sound and has movement and things like that as well. How do you decide what we need to read, what we need to learn, what we need to know as an audience to yeah. understand where you're coming from and what you're trying to say with the work? Well, what I've, what I've done is I almost haven't made that decision, but I have, if that makes sense, um, in that every image has a caption with it. Um, but the, the caption is fairly short. So each image is explained. Um, it's not like you know reams and reams and pages and pages of research. It's just a short explanation. So you are always aware of what it is you're looking at, and in some cases, what happened there. 
and then those captions are connected to the stories and the story is you know all the conversation that we had and so there's a full text of the conversation so the it, it is the full conversation that was recorded it's not just uh, sort of it's, bits it's, and pieces it's almost the yeah. full conversation you know, there's i my voice is taken out of it because my voice you know, my, my written voice in a way because that's not of interest right um and there's sometimes where the conversation went off onto completely random things about going shopping and stuff right. like that. But it's <laughs> what a and, what a terrific slice of cake right. this was. Exactly, <laughs> but that's, that's you know it's fantastic that you can talk about those things whilst you're talking about these other things. Right. But yeah, in general, you know, it's not the conversations aren't edited in the way that I I picked out bits and pieces. But you know, there were some where I I spoke for kind of two days with some people, and some of those conversations are so long that they would take a whole book by themselves. So there's some where we've um, you know, that we've kind of you know, taken sections from the middle, let's say, and you know, put them there, and then that's that's what you read. But it's it's not, you know, I haven't kind of changed the words and such. We're so as well, obviously, as well as working, you know, with a designer, we're working with a, a copy editor. Um, and one of the things with the conversations is that these are, you know, all these these twenty two voices are in different accents, and not not kind of you know audible accents, but written, mm -hmm, accents, mm -hmm. you know, in the words and how they speak. And obviously, when I when I transcribed the conversations, I transcribed them word for word. And when you when you hear those words, they make complete sense because it's being spoken to you. And you know, you 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 juggle these words around sometimes and these accents. But if you just write those words down exactly as they're spoken, it, it almost becomes illegible and unreadable. So there's this really fine process that I haven't done at all because I'm not skilled in that way, of sometimes changing a, a word or two not in any way to change the meaning of what's being said, but simply so that it's readable mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then it doesn't break the flow. And, it, you know, it's a huge skill to do that. And I've had like two people that have really helped me with that one person who's working with all the text and then a colleague of hers who's like a translator. And so when there's some that are in different languages, she's kind of come in and she's done that job at the same time, but with translation. So it's, it's a way of trying to be as, um, as close to the you know to the original words that were spoken to me as possible but so that they can be read literally read by an audience as well and it doesn't become confusing in that way um but then at the same time when you know when you have bits of audio so you know there's little bits of audio on the kickstarter video and when i do when i do talks i always play some of the audio and you know it's incredibly emotive because i can be telling someone about anna and arthur's story for instance and talking about specific locations and things that happened to them but, you know, my, my voice is generally like a visual thing as is my photographs and my voice. But I know, and, and this is the lovely thing about giving a talk about it, is I know that when I then play a small recording of Anna talking, for instance, for maybe 30 seconds, you can, the lovely thing is that there's that immediate connection between what I've been showing visually and what I've been telling about this person, you know, and I'm, I'm maybe I'm showing the portrait with them as well. And then as soon as the audience hears that voice as well, it's like that connection comes on goes up a whole nother level and it's almost as if the audience suddenly feel like they know Anna in this case and they are their friend and they they're there listening to what she's saying and then when, when I then continue and talk more about her story for instance or show or show more photographs they're, they're there with me you know and they're, they're listening to her voice through me in that way so so audio is, is, is incredible and that's the one thing that a book can't have so whilst I, I love book formats and because i think it gives you that that time by yourself to, you know to go in and out and to, to to give as much as you want to a book it's it's harder as the creator of a book it's harder because i'm still trying to get all that emotion across without those extra tools as it were without having you know movement and without having video and without having sound as sure well, that sure, sure but i think that's where the you know the design comes in hugely as well and the layout of text and things like that well, and it is so intimate and, and knowing that, that the audio, especially in the, in the Kickstarter trailer is the actual audio. It's not someone simply reciting or, or reenacting the audio, knowing that th this is the audio from the people that you spoke to, uh, as you said a moment ago, it just, it really does increase our, our engagement and our immersiveness as audience members. Yeah, it's, it's which is it's, it's very powerful, and yeah, there's there's some there's things like some of the you know of the people I met, there's very few of them who's well, you know, not that many of them that say who's where English was their first language, mm. um, and you know some of them would spoke to me in Russian and some spoke to me in French, and then it was kind of translated afterwards, 
But one lady, Rita, who lived, lived in Israel, she was from Hungary, Transylvania at first, and English was by far not her first language. It was maybe a third or fourth language that she could speak. Um, but one of the first things she said to me when I met her, and her daughter was there as well, um, is that she told me that she wanted to speak to me in English. And I, you know, I, and I remember asking us, you know, are you, are you sure? Because you don't need to if you want to speak in Hebrew or, you know, that's fine. And then, you know, we can translate this afterwards. And her daughter would be able to translate things as we went along. She said, no, so I want to speak in English because I want you to hear everything I'm telling you today. Wow. You know, she wanted, she wanted me to know what she was saying because it wasn't just that she was telling me these words and I could then go off. And, right. Don't interpret you know, what I'm saying. It, hear yeah, what I'm saying. She, Exactly. Yeah. Because, you know, she had, you know, important things to tell me, you know, one of the things she, she spoke about on that day, and, and this was after uh, part of her story when she's taken from a camp and put onto a, and, and then onto a death march from northern Poland. And then she was put onto some barges and taken out to sea and, you know, with no food and no engines, etc. and no drink. And, and they, her and the other people in this barge, you know, the ones that were left, they made this decision and they had no idea where they were, but they made this decision that they were going to jump off the barge and swim. In the direction they thought was ashore and because they made that choice you know they could die die on the boat or they could die in the water and she says she you know when she when she was doing that she knew that she she had to do it and she said you know, i had to survive because i had to tell this story but she did when she spoke to me she didn't just say i had to tell she said, i had to and then she said i had to i must tell this story and it was really beautiful because she, she was saying this in english so i knew exactly what she was saying in that very moment as well Wow. And so this is, you know, like 70 years after the event, but there was still that real urgency in her mind and her heart to tell this story, mm -hmm. you know, for, for the obvious reasons. What an honor. That. What an honor yeah. to be witness to that. In, incredible. You know, th there's, there's moments that I experienced, you know, during, during the conversations I had that, you know, I obviously didn't photograph. <laughs> you know, I, I would always take my portraits. I would always take at the end of our conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted the portrait to be that extension of the conversation I just had. But, you know, there was things that happened during it that, you know, I, I didn't photograph, but they'll stay with me forever. You know, incredibly sort of touching moments that were beautiful, really beautiful as human experiences and incredibly visually beautiful. You know, and if I just told someone about it now with, without without the, the context, you know, someone would say, oh my God, we should, that would be an amazing movie. Let's make a movie and we'll put a scene in and stuff like that because they're so beautiful. But, you know, it was never in my mind. I, I didn't even, I, I remember it's, it's funny I'm saying this, but I remember not even thinking I want to photograph this, but I shouldn't. It just never crossed my mind because it was just, you know, some beautiful kind of touching human moments between like a mother and a daughter in that case. So it's, um, you know, it's it's been incredible for me, you know, as, as an individual. And I feel, yeah, it's, you know, the, the experiences are, it's impossible to put them into words. Mm -hmm. some of them. It's, and, you know, they're with me forever for, and I'm going to, I'm going to say this very carefully, I'll say it, but they're with me forever for good and bad. Right. So the, the good is like the wonderful people that I've met. And the bad is the horrific things that I've heard. Yeah. That you've, that um, you've had to, to yeah. listen to on but, their behalf. You sure. know, it's like, and they're, and they're with me forever, but that's good. And they, they should be with me forever because, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to, to be free and alive, to be able to share these stories with other people through my photography. So it's, it's, good that i've experienced these things because without me experiencing them i wouldn't be able to share them sure in that way. and my mother said don't worry uh, and the soldier had a big sack she said just get into the sack it's okay and she said goodbye keep quiet don't say a word How has the response been to the Kickstarter relative to what you expected? Did you have expectations going in? I, I didn't know about your work when uh, when um, The Last Stand came out. Was it done in the same way? Um, no, the, well, yes and no. So The Last Stand was made, um, the funding of the work itself, The Last Stand, um, I put half the money in, it was, kind of took four years to make, and half the funding to make the work was put in by myself over those four years. Mm -hmm. And the other half was put in by two Kickstarter campaigns, um, which it, what, one was on Indiegogo because uh, Kickstarter didn't run in Europe at the time. Oh, really? Um, yeah, because this was like 2012. Huh. Um, and the second one was through a crowdfunding platform 
that I can't remember the name of because they went bust just as I was finishing my campaign. Oh, no. Um, they went into liquidation about five days after I finished my campaign. Oh, no. Luck, luckily, I got my money four days after I finished the campaign. Oh, my gosh. You know, it, it was it was one of those platforms that was set up specifically for documentary photography, and it was wow. going to be great because it would give you loads of connections with magazines and everything like that. But it, it all went a bit wrong. I've got no reason to why. But, you know, I got my money, so I was lucky. So um, the the the... the, the the kind of cost for the last hand to make the work was about sixteen thousand pounds in total, you know, wow. which was like film and traveling and mm -hmm. accommodation, all those kind of things. And that so was all the, large format film. Yeah, yeah, um, cheap flights and large format film, <laughs> um, very cheap hotels. <laughs> so I, I kind of put, you know, eight thousand of that I put in myself over a four year period, kind of taking bits from my commercial work, and the rest was funded. Um, and then the book was done completely differently. the The first two editions of the book were made by a publisher that. You know, unlike a lot of publishers, they kind of put all the money in themselves to do that. And mm -hmm. then I got royalties on it that way. Um, and then when I got the rights back for the book after the second edition, that's when I then decided to make the third edition and kind of since that, the reprint as well, which, I, which I've self-published myself. And so they were the third edition. I kind of just, I didn't do a Kickstarter. I just started doing pre-sales because I knew it could sell quite well. Yeah. And so my initial thought, I was going to, I wanted to make a kind of a more affordable copy. So I was going to do a, a softback, slightly smaller format digitally printed version with about 250 copies and then i got the proofs back from the, the printer and it was like well that's not going to work because of the kind of imagery it needed to be printed litho so it was suddenly it was going to be you know 350 copies and litho still softback and then the pre-sale started going better and then it was going to be well i really it really should be hardback because hardback's much better and then it became like 350 copies and a bit bigger and hardback and then it ended up as a thousand copies hardback wow. full litho printing because the pre-sales went well and then that third edition's you know sold out in about six months which was great wait so the which, third edition's uh, gone i've missed out well no because i did a reprint of the third edition ah okay so um, and, and it is the one on your website with this beautiful blind emboss yeah. on the cover yeah, yeah that's the one yeah so it's, it's it's almost exactly the same which is why it's a reprint as opposed to a fourth edition okay um the only difference is the the paper stock on the front cover is very slightly different color but otherwise the design and everything and you know the weight of the book and the pages and the images are exactly the same so it's a third edition reprint in that way but then so yeah coming back to the question so a wounded landscape has been made differently so a wounded landscape was um again the making of the work you know it's 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 cost up upwards of like thirty thousand pounds or more to wow. make because it's six years of traveling how do you sell this book for 40 pounds because it, um, it, it seems yeah. that, that the value for money there far outweighs you know what what you're getting far outweighs what you're paying yeah it's basically it's um it's about how how i who i want to see the book um you know in, in terms of content for a photo book especially you know with, with this many pages you know like i mentioned it's not massive in size but it's 750 pages and normally a book like that would sell for 60 70 80 pounds um easily and that, that yeah easily that's normal thing that what's important to me and this is because of the, you know, in general with my work, but especially because of the content and the nature of this subject matter, is I don't want this book to be only a luxury mm -hmm. item. And I'm completely aware that even like a £25 photo book or a £35 photo book is a luxury item compared to some other things. But if you're looking just in terms of photo books, I really want to keep the book under £50. Um, because it, to, to my mind, you know, to some other people I've had conversations with, but mostly to my mind, if it goes, if if a book is 50 pounds or over, it's a luxury item for a photo book. So it's really important for me to do that. And the, the main reason being that I want people to be able to buy the book because it's pointless me doing all this work and raising money and pay, making books if no one can afford to buy it. So I always wanted to keep it under 40, under 50 pounds, excuse me. Um, and so the pricing I had for it was um, kind of 45 pounds for a book and 50 pounds for a signed book. But then for this Kickstarter campaign, I've reduced that. Mm -hmm. 40 pounds for the book and 45 the signed book because it just seemed like the right, the right thing to do for the kickstarter campaign and it was trying to find that balance between raising enough funds but selling enough copies and having enough backers and stuff like that and i, I think at the moment i've got the right balance mm -hmm. but it but it's difficult because it obviously means that i need to sell because you know just because i'm choosing to sell the book at 40 or 45 pounds instead of 60 pounds it makes no difference to the actual cost of the print right you know, the printing so it just means i have to sell a lot more books to get that to get that to that to get, marker to get, yeah, yeah sure get that mar the market which basically pays for the print and design and everything like that but that's that kind of decision i've taken the i guess what allows me to do that is that i'm self-publishing it 
Um, it would be a lot harder if, if I was going with the publisher, it would be a much harder decision for them to make. Um, and they probably wouldn't be able to make that for financial reasons. But because I'm doing it myself and it's um, it's a financial decision I, I can choose to take in a way. And, you know, it's, um, you know, I, I won't hide the fact that I need to make some money from this book because it will allow me to, to make more work like this sure. completely. But I'm not and I've never made this work as a commercial venture. It's never about making money. It's it's much more about um, making the work so these stories can be shared in that way. But at the same time, you have to be you know, financially realistic about it. And you can't you can't give the book away because otherwise you won't get enough money to print it in the right, first place. Right, right in that way so it's that it's that very fine kind of balance um i hope i'm getting it right but it's you know it's hard to tell it seems like you are i mean we're at the time of this recording we're what a, a week in yeah i've said we're on the sixth day today yeah and you're 75 or so percent there yeah which is that's phenomenal yeah I'm, I'm really happy with that this is the it's actually today is the first day where i've i've actually felt really positive about it and, I, and I'm really starting to think that this book may happen. Um, even when I was yesterday on 66% or 67%, it still felt very uncertain because you kind of, with a Kickstarter campaign, you have that feeling that, well, this is brilliant. All these people are supporting it, but maybe this is all the people that are going to support it. And they've just all done it in the first six days. And now it's going to just drop completely. Right. It um, doesn't seem to be the case, though. Well, and... no. And, and these campaigns, they do, they kind of flatten out for the sort of middle, you know, mm -hmm. middle 20 days. And you mm -hmm. have those first few, four or five first days. And then you have the last two, three days. But the, the good thing, I think, the positive thing is that I haven't really started doing press about it yet. Um, so this is all on the back of my own kind of promotion and stuff like that. So I'm starting to work on you know, some limited kind of press this week and some of the people who have supported me making the work, um, like Metro and the Holocaust Exhibition and Learning Centre in, in England, they're going to start kind of doing some promotion and press about it as well, which is great. So that will hopefully bring in a whole other audience to the work as well, which right. is another thing that's really important to me. And this is throughout all my work is I never want to make photo books just for photographers. Um you know, I want to make photo books for everyone, you know, that has an interest in the subjects I make in that, in that way. So that's what's really nice having, you know, kind of working with other people means that their their audience and their network isn't an audience and network of photographers, it's an audience and network of, you know, readers and viewers who have right. other interests and will hopefully be interested in, in my work as well. In that way. Does this project where it is now, a wounded landscape, does this represent everything you have to say about this or will you revisit this in the future and and do you have any idea of where you go from here in terms of um, what your next body of work should be yeah so i feel as though this won't be my last piece of work mm -hmm. on the holocaust for mm -hmm. instance I, you know there's there's so, so much more to say and mm -hmm. so much more to be told about it but i don't know what yet and i i, I kind of think maybe it, it will either come to me or I'll come across it over the next you know, sort of two, three years. Um, but it's definitely pushed me forward in the way that, you know, whereas compared, say, to The Last Stand, that the, the really important thing with my voice as a photographer is to tell these stories, um, but to tell these stories in my particular way. So not necessarily in traditional, because, you know, I'm not a traditional documentary photographer, I don't think, um, in the kind of imagery I use, even though I tell stories that are traditionally within the genre of documentary photography, I don't think I, my photography itself is maybe that traditional, but it's, it's not in any kind of way constructed, you know, there's no kind of falseness to them in any way at all. So, you know, my, I can see myself doing more work about this, but when I say about this, it's, you know, doing more work about sort of trauma and tragedy and genocide, um, whether it will be the particular subject of the Holocaust, I don't know. You know, it, it, it could be, but then it could be other things as well, you know, to do that, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it does. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I've, I've got my, I'm, I've started work on my next project as well. I've got an, another new project I'm going to be doing in Italy next year, but I've kind of started some new work in Ukraine at the moment as well, um, which is going to take hopefully a year to make, which would be very quick for me. Because <laughs> right. normally my work is, you know, five, six years. Um, but the idea is to do it in a year if we can. But that's very much about stories as well. Um, not connected to um, a long ago history, but it's kind of, it's, 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 it's historical work, but it's kind of current history as well in that way. Um, but it's very much story based. So it's a work that's going to come out of telling, you know, sort of 15 or 20 stories in that way. I, I love how you approach 
your work as, and it seems this way, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like there is there is not only importance for the work itself, but there's importance to you in playing the creative long game and and really diving into a project or a story or a body of work that needs to be told and and feeling like you are um, doing it justice and not just skimming you know sort of over the surface to to give us a a view from a distance but really show us as a as an audience as a viewer uh, the marrow of what it is that you're trying to see yeah um i can't i can't imagine doing it any other way really you know that that, that that's the way I, I think it should be done and at the same time i know i'm i'm very aware that i'm lucky to be in the situation i am that i can do that you know that i can give it the time um you know if i had you know i have other responsibilities obviously but in, in terms of my photography i can give you know I've, I've always kind of i kind of work as a commercial photographer as well you know kind of photographing in the interiors and architectural work in that way I, I have up until um the covid crisis um and that's always given me the the time ability to make these long-term projects in that that work would always you know feed me and put petrol in my car and clothes on me and stuff like that and i would always but in a way, buy time from my commercial work to then make this project work that I would work on getting funding to make the work and stuff like that. You know, start off with my own money, then try and get funding. So I feel really lucky in a way that I can put all this time into my work, that I'm not constrained by time necessarily or the constraints of it being commissioned in that way. Because, you know, commissions can be very liberating but and they can give you opportunities that you wouldn't have otherwise, but they can sometimes, they can come with constraints sometimes. Um, and but it's you know so yeah I'm lucky I can work that way but I, that's how I enjoy to work I enjoy to immerse myself in a in a subject and I, I you know and I think I'll do it more and more and more as I go along I I can't I can't see myself ever wanting to kind of stand back and look at things from the outside or just you know do something on the surface I can I can only ever see myself wanting to make pieces of work that you know that I've really kind of thrown myself into in that way and you know the reason to me is simple is that if I'm telling someone's story I, I need to get i need to get to know them so that i can tell their story properly if you'd like to see mark's work or purchase a book or a print visit his website at markwilson.co.uk that's m-a-r-c-w-i-l-s-o-n.co.uk you can also find him on twitter and instagram at mark wilson photo you can subscribe to Process Driven in your favorite podcast app or subscribe to Jeffrey Sidoris Everything to get every episode of every show that I produce in a single feed. Connect with me on my website at jeffreysidoris.com, that's J-E-F-F-E-R-Y-S-A-D-D-O-R-I-S, or on Twitter or Instagram at Jeffrey Sidoris. If you've got questions or feedback or maybe a suggestion for a Process Driven guest, email me at talkback at jeffreysidoris.com. I'll be back next week with another conversation, and I hope you'll join me. Until then, as always, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening, and I'll talk to you on the next one.